Hello again, this is a second part of our session on the planetary context of physical geography. And in this, I just want to say a few words about the Coriolis effect, which is something that we'll come back to over and over again as we get deeper and deeper into physical geography. The Coriolis effect is what makes things like currents of air that you'd expect to flow in a straight line from areas of high to low pressure actually follow a curved path. It also affects ocean currents and aeroplanes. So why does that happen? One way that people often try to explain the Coriolis effect is by drawing lines on a spinning turntable. And it might actually help to think of the Earth in that same pattern. The animation in the top right hand corner here is something that you can find lots of different versions of if you have a quick search on the internet. And what it's showing is in the top part, a vertical look down onto a spinning record turntable or a spinning surface. And we're imagining that we're drawing a straight line down that spinning surface towards the edge while the disc is spinning. Now, as we were doing that, drawing straight down the line while the thing was spinning, because the thing was spinning, the apparent tra trajectory of our line is being deflected off to the right because the disc is spinning round in the other direction. Now, if we transfer that idea onto our um, top down view of the Earth here, at the equator, the Earth is spinning at a rate of 1660 kilometers per hour. That's how fast something on the equator would need to be moving to get all the way around a daily rotation of the Earth in a day. At the North Pole, because it's just a point, it's spinning on the spot, so it isn't actually moving anywhere. And so as we move from the equator towards the pole, the speed at which any point on the surface is moving is getting lower and lower. Now, to help you understand the implications of, it, of this, imagine that you're traveling in a railway carriage and you stand up to go to the buffet car. And while you're standing up in the train, you decide to jump with joy. You're so much enjoying your, your trip. So you jump a foot off the ground in the railway carriage. Now, meanwhile, the railway is still, the, the railway train is still moving forwards. Your carriage is still moving forwards. What happens to you? Do you suddenly find that you're being hit in the back by the end of the carriage, which has come up to catch you because you've left contact with it, stopped moving and the train is overtaking you? No, you don't. Because when you jump up in the air, you carry with you the momentum that you've inherited from the forward moving train. So somebody looking at you from outside the train wouldn't see you jumping vertically upwards and dropping vertically back downwards again. To them, you'd appear to be leaping forwards along with the train and then arcing back down onto the floor uh, later on. Now, the same happens if you jump up in the air or take off or send a packet of air moving from this location, heading to the north. Here, it's got this angular momentum, this orbital velocity, if you like, uh, or this rotational velocity of 1600 plus kilometers per hour. It retains that as it's moving north. The Earth underneath it is moving gradually slower and slower and slower. But our plane or our packet of air is going at this faster rate. So as it moves north, it will appear to be drifting to the right on this diagram because the Earth underneath it is moving slower and slower and slower and slower as we move further north. So there's a deflection or an apparent deflection to the right because of the velocity inherited or the momentum inherited in our moving package of air and the actual velocity of the ground underneath it. Well, that effect influences all sorts of things moving around on the Earth's surface. And as you can see here in the northern hemisphere, it leads to a deflection to the right. In the southern hemisphere, it leads to a deflection to the left. And that affects ocean currents, winds. Here you'd expect wind maybe to be flowing from this higher pressure zone in a straight line into the lower pressure zones to the north and south. But in fact, it gets deflected. Here, deflected to the right. So the wind appears to be coming from the west, even though really it's deri deriving from the south. 
and here these trade winds are deflected again northern hemisphere that they're deflected to the right because the earth underneath them is, is moving faster than the point where they set off from if you like so this there's this deflection instead of flowing straight north to south they're deflected to the right and flowing from the northeast these global effects are well known and they're very important now one of the things that we focus on in in this module and i know some of you who are watching this will be doing uh, the patchwork assessment theme about how large scale effects have small scale impacts and, and vice versa one of the things we're interested in is how major global systems and major global processes or effects such as the coriolis effect can have local impact and i just want to give you a, a a nice local case study of the impact of the coriolis effect based around here uh, in the isle of Port portland in southern england so the situation that we're dealing with here is a promontory out into the english channel land here is in black and ocean is in white with uh, submarine contours marked and here's a submarine sandbank a big larger one here on the east side of the promontory and a smaller one here on the west hand side of the promontory and here in the english channel the tide goes up the channel and back down the channel repeatedly in a cycle over the days so we have a an up and down alternating or oscillating flow of the current in response to the daily tides and what we're going to what we're going to um, look at now is an illustration of how that tidal flow because of the impact of Coriolis effect has led to there being different sized sandbanks on either side of this promontory uh, out into the channel we have a slightly simplified version of that, that topography here to help show what's going on. We've actually reversed it so that now the headland, the land, is poking up the picture into the ocean, uh, which is out here in the top of the picture. And we have this reversing tidal flow going up the channel or down the channel at different points during the day. And this diagram shows eddies on the lee side of this headland for the tidal flow at different times in the day. So this one is relating to the tidal flow heading towards the left and this one, the solid line, relates to the tidal flow heading to the right. So at some times of day the tide is going this way and we have an eddy here. At other times of day the tide is going this way and we have an eddy here. Now to help you get your head around this before we start talking about the different um, eddies, do a little experiment, get a cup of water, a glass of water, and put some sand or some, some grains of something in, in the bottom of your, your glass of water, and then spin the glass of water in your hand just to get the water swirling around the edge of the, the cup, or stir your cup of tea very vigorously with the, with the tea leaves uh, showing through in the bottom of the tea. As you do that, if you stir hard enough or shake hard enough, the, the water or the tea will ride up the outside of, the, of your, your teacup a little bit, and the particles that are sitting on the bottom will be forced inwards by that pressure gradient of the high, the greater depth of water pushing against the walls of the cup at the outside. That will force the grains of sand in towards the middle. So while your water is riding up the edge of your cup, the sand grains at the bottom of the cup will be being pushed in towards the middle of the cup and will gather in the middle. Just stir a, stir a glass of water with some bits in the bottom of it and you'll see what I'm talking about. That's a, a helpful process to remember when you're trying to envisage what's happening here with the tidal flow. So let's think first of all about this eddy on the, the dotted line uh, tidal flow. This cyclonic, in other words, anti-clockwise circulating flow. So if we're stirring our cup of tea anti-clockwise like that, we're generating a centrifugal force outwards towards the edge of the cup, CF, centrifugal force. Because of that rotation, there's a force driving outwards, just like there was when you were stirring your cup. Now, we're in the Northern Hemisphere here, so Coriolis force is deflecting off to the right from our line of motion. So Coriolis effect is adding a force adding on to that centrifugal force. So the total pressure gradient, pushing our sand grains back into the middle of the circulation or pushing our sugar back into the middle of our, our teacup, if we're thinking that way, is a combination of the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force adding together 
to generate this compensating pressure gradient into the center. Now, when the tide changes and the water goes the other way, and we have a residual eddy on this side of the headland, how much of a sandbank are we going to be building up here? Well, in this situation, we have a clockwise circulation. So we still have a centrifugal force pushing outwards from that flow and generating a pressure gradient back inwards. But here, the deflection to the right of the Coriolis effect is applying a force inwards into our circle. So the centrifugal force and the Coriolis force are operating in different directions. So the Coriolis force actually detracts from the, from the centrifugal force in terms of generating this pressure gradient. So the pressure gradient driving the sand grains in your teacup in towards the middle is less here with our clockwise circulation than it was here with our anticlockwise circulation because the Coriolis force being deflected to the right has a contributory effect here and it has a diminishing effect here because of the different directions of rotation. In our teacup that results in more or fewer tea leaves gathering in the middle of our cup. In this coastal sedimentation example it results in a bigger sandbank here and a small sandbank here which as any um, fishermen will tell you is very important uh, for fish stocks and fish supplies, for example. And here's just another um, sketch map showing roughly how that works uh, in terms of that particular case study that we started talking about a few minutes ago. So I think that's a nice example showing how something that we normally talk about at a global scale with uh, hemispheric scale circulations of ocean water and atmosphere can also be brought down to a much more local scale, thinking about local coastal landforms in, in this particular case study that we've just looked at. So always remember that things apply at a variety of different scales. We've covered quite a lot of material quite quickly in the two parts of this, uh, this lecture. So I've put a few reinforcement questions up here. You can pause the, uh, pause the tape, pause the video and work through these and make sure that you've picked up all these points as we've been working through. And by way of conclusion to this pair of mini lectures, when you've done some background reading to reinforce what we've been discussing, you should now be able to explain some of the ways in which Earth's physical geography is controlled by its characteristics as a rotating, orbiting planet. We've looked at all sorts of different things very briefly, tides, seasons, Coriolis force, the definitions of the Arctic and the Antarctic, the tropics and the equator and so on. A huge amount of basic physical geography stems from these fundamental planetary controls. We'll be exploring those as the course continues, but it's important that you have this fundamental understanding of the, these basics uh, as we move ahead.